On this episode of China Unscripted, no one knows how China's economy really works. And as it hits a wall, China could become an actualized North Korea. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Chow. And I'm Matt Kanesta. Joining us today is David Day, chairman of the Global Risk Mitigation Foundation. Based in Hawaii, Mr. Day is one of the leading international legal practitioners in the Asia-Pacific region. He's the former chairman of the China Belt and Road Task Force of the American Bar Association's International Section, and he's the architect of an educational program on China for lawyers all over the world. Thanks for joining us. Well, it's nice to be here, Chris, and um, I, I think this is going to be an interesting conversation for all of us. Yeah, I'm definitely excited about this. Um, let's just start with a uh, with a little bit of background before we get into the nitty gritty of it. But you know, it's it's very clear China's economy is in trouble, and I think one of the latest things that has come out that really kind of shocked a lot of people is that over the past three years, China's stock market has lost six trillion dollars in value. Is it? Yeah, something like that. That's pretty close. What, what is happening with China's stock market? Well, um, stock stock markets are based on perception, as you well know, and so uh, there are there are a lot of indicators that affect that perception, and um, uh, the perception is is Chris is not good, and uh, that's because uh, the the economy has effectively hit a wall, and I think that that's that's something that 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 would be interesting for your viewers to explore further is why, why, why is the economy hit a wall and what does it mean? Well, yeah, real quick. Is it, do you think of the perception changed first or that the economy uh, hit a wall first and that changed the perception? I think the economy has started to hit a wall. And what happens is with an opaque system like China's, there are um, bits and pieces of evidence that start to dribble out and then it form, it paints a picture and people start to connect the dots. But guys like Jamie Dimon are saying, hey, you know, it's not, the situation's not that bad. Well, that's because, you know, Jamie Dimon is like uh, many uh, Western financiers, like Wall Street, doesn't really understand the inner workings of uh, a very opaque economy that was never designed for foreigners to understand in the first place. And so he's, he's, using, um, he's using terms that his investors, um, the general public in Western countries, they understand a single number. That is the, typically they use the, he'll use the GDP number and um, it's based on completely false data. So what happens when you use a number like that based on false data, what comes out is you, you either see that China is booming or it's about ready to implode. And none of those are correct. Is it also, do you think, maybe a little bit of a con, which is that if Wall Street executives say China's stock market's doing well, then it uh, maintains the prices so there's not as, as fast of a sell-off, and then they have time to get their money out, or at least they don't lose as much. Well, absolutely, Matt. And that's that's um, <clears throat> really part of the Ponzi scheme, the way that the, the economy has been operating and that the uh, elite vanguard of the party has been taking, adva- taking advantage of, um, of the, 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 the Wall Street types um, because what happens is that, you know, you take a company like Morgan Stanley or, or any number of others, BlackRock, for instance, they, they make money with the investors pouring their savings into IRA accounts or, you know, uh, whatever the investment might be. And once you understand the way the economy is built, you'll see that that's pretty much a one way street, meaning the, the, foreign convertible con- currency goes into China. And unless the particular business has some means of trading the domestic currency to another company or another firm, they're not going to bring any profits out. They just have to keep, the party has got it set. So they keep reinvesting and keep building the economy in China. So uh, a company, for instance, like Disney, um, 
they have a pretty good setup because what Disney does is with their operations in China is they take U.S. dollars in through their investors. And what happens is that they go around and, and purchase in the local currency, the uh, domestic yuan, they purchase the Mickey Mouses and the Cinderella dresses and so forth made in China to use in their various theme parks. So Disney can burn their profits in the local currency, whereas other companies who don't have that type of connection, they're basically, they have a one-way street. And so the, the financial firms, Matt, you're right, they make their money by getting people to invest. And so there is a, a um, built-in, everything is great in China, kind of a, um, a situation that causes people to want to invest and the brokerage firms, Wall Street, they make money on the investment. And the fact that the profits aren't coming back out is not their problem. No, I was wondering, David, if we could kind of go into something you mentioned earlier, which is the, the idea that, you know, people don't actually understand what the how the Chinese economy is built and that it's way more complicated than the GDP number. I think I think people are more understanding that the GDP is often fake or As massaged. Lika Chiang said, yeah. man-made and unreliable. Yes, but then people try to come up with all these other ways to look at the economy, but there's essentially it's it's hard to see what's actually going on. So can you tell us what actually like how the economy really works in China? Well, okay, so let's you know, interrupt me if it's not clear and l- let me let me have a shot at this. Um after the, or the Korean War, what happened was that the, the basically newly formed People's Republic of China um, uh, faced a trade blockade from the United States. And the U.S. cut them off 100 percent, and the, the party returned with a 100 percent blockade on exports to the United States. And that, that whole blockade lasted until about 15 years, till 1965. So it was during that period that um, the, the, in the early days that the Communist Party decided that they were going to build a, an economy that was essentially shockproofed from the outside world. So if you look at the People's Republic of China, It is one of, uh, let's call it maybe five or six economies in the world that have dual currencies, meaning that there is a local currency and um, and there is the foreign exchange. Now, as all three of you probably know, the domestic yuan, domestic currency, sometimes called the renminbi, is not convertible on the open market. And the party wants it this way. Why is that? Because essentially it is a worthless script. It has no value except what the party assigns to it. And so that's used for operating internally inside the borders of China. I I just want to clarify. So that so it's not based on gold or anything like the U.S. dollar. It's just completely, the government says it's worth this. Well, well I mean, I mean, in fairness, the U.S. currency is also gold. a fiat currency. Yeah. So, and I don't, I can't think of any major economy that doesn't have a fiat currency. That is a, uh, it's not backed by any um, gold or, or something like that. So, but, so why is then the, the renminbi different in that regard than say the U.S. dollar? Because the U.S. dollar is convertible on the open market outside the country. You can use it and convert it into other currencies. And the internal domestic yuan is not. And so what has to happen is there is an organization within, you know, high up within the party called the, uh, uh, the state administration for foreign exchange. Interestingly, it, it, the acronym is SAFE, S-A-F-E. And that organization controls the movement of currency across the international border into China. So as an example, a company that's going to do an investment is sending 
U.S. dollars or other convertible foreign cu currency to China, and this organization takes and holds that currency. It's a safe, controlled by the Communist Party. And then the, the, or, the state organization, SAFE, then issues the, the script that has no value to whatever company or individuals that it's directed to. It's kind of like, um, Matt, I don't know if you've ever been to you know, a carnival where you go and you take your, your money and you buy this script to go on various rides within the carnival. But if you go outside the carnival, you can't use the script to, at a 7-Eleven or a gas station for anything. It has no value. The reason that they have this dual currency economy is that the belief was during this period from the 1950 to 1965 that they wanted to build an economy that had no single point of failure. So, and they wanted to maintain control internally within the country. And so what they did was they built this dual currency economy controlled by this state administration for foreign exchange, SAFE, and uh, that allows them to uh, move financially, domestically within China. And it means that there's no cost of capital within China. So when someone wants to do a project, they print more script. Now, here's the interesting piece. There is a political cost because they're shifting priorities within the government but there's not a cost of capital as a Western economist would understand it. Now, coming over back a little bit to Shelley, your point, the reason that um, the Western economists and the Wall Street types don't really understand the inner workings of the Chinese economy is because they're looking at it from the outside using the tinted lenses that they have acquired in their Western classic economic education. There are a few academics in China that are Westerners that understand how the economy works, but they're not going to write articles and books about it because they'll lose their stature with the party. The only people foreigners that really understand the inner workings of the party are those that have been in China for decades. They've done deals. They've done like some of my clients and colleagues. They've actually done trades or transactions with the party. And so it's a matter of practical understanding how this works. So one final point here on this. When the 2008 mortgage meltdown occurred, in our country and a lot of places around the world, that financial crisis. Because China's currency did not float, that, that two currency, dual currency system acts as a shock absorber to protect the internal workings of, uh, of their economy. And it also protects the party's control. And there are something like five or six other countries in the world that have an economy that's somewhat similar. Um, Cuba, uh, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, North Korea. Interestingly, they're all communist, or in the case of Laos, maybe Cambodia, communist leaning. And the reason that they have that set up is they're authoritarian and it allows them to have absolute control internally within the country. So it's basically that that by not allowing the Zhenminbi to float on the international markets, uh, the international markets cannot determine the value of the currency. And therefore, it's the party that does it. But but my, I have a couple of questions. With that. One is that there there is some convertibility, which is that I believe you're allowed to take the equivalent of about $50,000 out a year at maximum for Chinese for, citizens. For Chinese citizens, I mean that's uh, so, almost nothing. Right? Well, it's 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 nothing if you're a, a multi multi millionaire. Um, but um, the other thing is, I, I remember when, 
the, the last time I was in the mainland, it was like 8.26 uh, yuan to the dollar, and it was it was fixed. It was pegged to the dollar. And then at some point, they let it float a little bit, but the float was always kind of controlled. But I feel like it's it's the float is whatever they say it is, because they say instead of pegging it to the dollar, they peg it to a basket of currencies. But no one knows what is in that basket of currencies. So in, in effect, they could just make it whatever they need it to be. So the basket could contain rotten apples? I mean, I don't think that's a, a valid currency on the world market, but okay. <laughs> well, so then I guess this goes back to Shelley's original question. Like the, the these Western economists and businessmen, they have an idea of like how an economy works in the West or in like a Western style economic system. Correct. Wh how, what is driving China's economy? What's happening in there? Why has it hit this wall? Okay. So- you have seen the um, real estate and the stock markets take enormous tumbles. And uh, that's related to the fact that the, the Chinese citizen has got very few options in terms of things that they can do to invest their monies. And so they can either buy real estate or they can maybe, buy, you know, invest in stocks in some companies. So that they, they tied up their savings. And then as a result of various perceptions uh, on where the economy is going, those things have, have slid down. Now, what's happened, Chris, is that um, the reason that China has hit the wall, those, those are my, my terms, is that if you sit back and you look at the real big picture of the development of an economy of a country over a, a, a period of time, basically you end up dividing it into two stages. And this is true with, with the way that our own country developed. So in the first stage, which we have seen in China, and it ran from about, I would say 1980 to maybe somewhere in the 2005 or maybe 2010 period, is a period of hard infrastructure development. We saw that in our own country starting about in the 19th century after the Civil War with the Transcontinental Railroad, and then it went into the 19th century with building of things like the Golden Gate Bridge, the Hoover Dam, the interstate highway system, things like that. And in China, we've seen the development of all kinds of hard infrastructure assets. And so this is the stage one. This is the real easy part of the development of an economy. Now, where the wall is in going from a stage one to a stage two, this is where you get into the development of the human resources and human capital of a country. And, and that that development is what leads to more and more innovation and more sophisticated products, projects, software, more sophisticated. So what's happened is that China is on the outer or beyond the outer edge of this stage one. They've got this. I mean, you look at a map of China and you see this massive network of, of rail systems all over the country. And one of the, one of the things they did with the Belt and Road exercise, just a piece of it, was so they could continue building and, and provide jobs uh, outside of the country. That was part of the plan, a piece of it, of, of the whole Belt and Road Initiative. So in moving into this second stage, this is way more complicated and takes way more time. And it, it it means that China is going to have to really change its way of thinking. It, and, and this whole notion of um, party authoritarian Leninist thinking is blocking China moving into this stage, stage two. So it's kind of like that old story of the Vermont farmer. Who's, who's standing on the side of the road and the tourist comes up and asks him for directions to the nearest 7-Eleven. And the farmer tells the tourist, you can't get there from here. And that's precisely where China is. 
because it's Leninist rigid thinking is unless you believe that Xi Jinping is going to initiate some massive reform, they can't get into stage two because they can't get that that development of freedom and human resources that's going to going to allow them to move beyond where they are. So the reality is when you look at China's economy, it's divided into various pieces that we can talk about later. It becomes, it's very, very fragmented. But essentially the big picture is China cannot move into stage two because it's communist way of thinking, its party principles are blocking it. That's why my view is, as we look forward into the future, China's economy has basically hit its level of productivity. We will see maybe some modest changes over time, but essentially it's leveled out and it's going to be a little bit like Japan for the foreseeable future. Can they borrow stage two? From the West, borrow. Like what I yes, I'm, what I mean is steal. Like what I'm thinking of is, if you talk about things like this authoritarian system has a hard time of, you know, having technological innovation. Could you just lure like Microsoft or Nvidia or something and be like, come here and develop your chips and computer software and stuff in China domestically, and then they can, you know, essentially take that intellectual property. Well, Shelley, that's a really, a really dynamite question. And if you look historically, go back to some date like 2010, 2005, something like that, you will see the, the party attempting to do precisely what you've described. And so they'll be looking at ways that they can capture the innovation, capture the intellectual property. In fact, there's a, there's a, a saying in China translated in English to justify this, and it goes basically, it it's, goes something like this. It's, we are not stealing. We are simply standing on the shoulders of giants. And, and, and that was their justification for, for not having the ability to innovate. Now, we have seen in the ethnic Chinese who are allowed freedoms in Taiwan, as an example, they don't have a problem going into stage two. And this is one of the real problems that Xi Jinping has with Taiwan, is that month by month, year by year, Taiwan is pulling away from China in terms of its success of an its economic model. So today, as we look at the two countries, Mainland China looks more and more like East Berlin because of its authoritarian control. And Taiwan looks more and more like West Berlin. And this is a problem for the party, its leadership, and its survival. And this is one of the big incentives for pushing to get control of Taiwan because there are plenty of people in China saying, why can't we have this freedom? Why can't we do be like Taiwan? Well, what is it about authoritarianism and communism that so stifles innovation that, I mean, there's hardly any innovations coming out of China since, you know, in 70 years uh, for a country that used to invent, you know, myriad things, you know, had the best shipbuilding in the world, you know, invented the, you know, paper and, and gunpowder and all these things, right? Historically, they have had no innovation essentially in 70 years. I, what, what is the mechanism? Like, what is it about that model that makes it so impossible to come up with new stuff? Well, the answer to that, Matt, is that, that when you look at the mindset of a real entrepreneur or an inventor, it's really a free thinking a uh, freewheeling mindset that uh, allows risk taking. It allows failure, um, and and that's the type of nurturing of that type of environment that many countries in the West, including our own, 
have developed with our education system, with our political system over over a number of years. And I suppose someone who had who, who was living in the United States, who had grown up under that system, could add to my comment here and 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 perhaps uh, uh, flesh it out a little further. But the point that you made is really interesting in that China doesn't really innovate much. It is a um, either it's a joint uh, a joint venture where the intellectual property is transferred. Or as as you know, Shelley has pointed out, they steal it, and this is why they're not going to get into stage two. It's going to be until they change that political system. So where I'm going with this is there are lots of people out there that have seen the Evergrande crash, the the loss in the uh, in the stock market, the situation that that. Investors in China uh, who who bought condominiums on on the in speculating before before they were actually constructed are ended up with mortgages paying mortgages on property that will never be built they'll never own and and you look at that situation and there are people who say well the, you know we're going to have an economic implosion and. I don't think that's what's going to happen. And for those who are sitting around waiting for an economic implosion, you know, I think what we're going to see is is more likely is a social implosion or a political one. And we can talk about that further. Yeah, this is interesting because you have mentioned earlier that some people look at the made up GDP data and think China's booming or it's going to completely collapse. And you say both of those are wrong. So... You mentioned it's not going to be an economic implosion. It's going to be a social implosion. What do you think is going to be the end result of this? Like, what does that look like, maybe, first of all? Well, we saw last year uh, the unemployment numbers for the younger generation shut down because they were getting ugly. Um, I remember numbers in the low 20s, and there was speculation that you know, realistically, they were in the 40 percent range, and and then we have seen um, this flight capital movement into Singapore, which has been almost unbelievable, and then we have seen the the um, tremendous movement of Chinese nationals across our own border, coming into our own country. Um, and and finally, then there's this this development among the youth in China called laying flat, lying flat. They don't do anything. They just stay at home. They're discouraged. All kinds of uh, clinical depression cases uh, have skyrocketed in China, and and so the social implosion. Um, if you remember. There, there was a number, and I believe it was something like 5%, a 5% GDP number was what China ha- had to maintain in order to retain social stability. Okay. So ask yourself, in the last two, three years, have you seen any GDP numbers coming out of the party that are less than 5%? Well, I mean, uh, not officially. Right. And, and, and so they're doing everything they can to maintain social stability. And my point here is that there, there is the potential that's very dangerous in China that the social compact between the people and the party, the mandate of heaven, if you will, when that is finally perceived to be shattered, then the Communist Party has got a political problem on its hands. And so what is that compact? The, the, essentially, the agreement was, okay, party, you get to have authoritarian control, but in return, we get to have uh, rising income and building of wealth. And so long as you do that for us, we'll cede control. That's basically the social compact. And so if we look from the Cultural Revolution coming all the way forward to just the pandemic, 
those generations of Chinese have never known any kind of setback financially. It's been increases every single year. And now it's, it's on the ropes. And so the, the danger of some type of social political implosion is where I would be concerned. And as we get closer to that, Matt, I think that um, the economic situation in China um, means that they, there is going to be more pressure on the military, on the national defense, and in difficult economic times, there, there's always the possibility that she will bet the farm and do something irrational in terms of uh, a military movement. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the way that I see it developing. When, when you talk about the social implosion, I think a lot of people may expect it to be triggered by some large, let's say, collapse in the real estate market or that kind of – I think when we're, we think of an economic implosion, that's what people would think of, right? Like some big economic catastrophe, then that triggers some kind of social. But you're saying that there's probably not going to be the ec economic catastrophe part of it. Yeah, I think that if – if the people are sitting around waiting for the People's Republic of China to have an economic implosion that, you know, on a relative scale looks like Zimbabwe or, or Somalia, um, a large industrialized economy doesn't collapse like that. And what happens is that it's, it becomes extremely stressed. And this is part of this leveling out this Japan-like future that the social issues start to become extremely painful. And uh, I don't know what could trigger it, uh, Shelley, kind of any, any number of things. Um, but I think that it's important to remember that in the back of the mind of the, the party's leadership, what is their greatest fear? And their greatest fear is is something like a Ceausescu moment occurring in China. And for your viewers who don't recall, this, this was in December of 1989 when Nikolai and Elena Ceausescu, the, the, the rulers of Romania, were brutally executed by a firing squad when the people finally turned on them. And this really sh has shaken up generations of Chinese leaders because Nikolai Ceausescu was a Mao-loving, PRC-supporting uh, dictator of Romania. And um, if, you, if you look at the, the, the dates, it was just in April of that year that Tiananmen Square occurred. And a few months later, I guess it was in about November of 1989, the Berlin Wall came down, and then boom, this, this whole regime in Romania not only imploded, but its leadership was brutally executed by firing squads. So this is in the back of the minds of the leadership in, in Beijing. And so this is, the, this is this potential for a social implosion that I'm talking about. At some point, we may see that. And it, it will be brutal and it will be very fast. So is there, since this all depends on the economy, is there something the Chinese Communist Party can do to keep the economy going? Either if it stays in a stage one type of economy, just somehow figure out a way to keep building, somehow fix the real estate market, or if it wants to go to the stage two economy, just steal more intellectual property. Is there a way the CCP can just keep this, to keep its economy going? Well, they're going to, Chris, they're going to reverse it. Yeah, they're going to they're going to continue to tread. Uh, basically, I'm going to call it treading water. They're not going to make real progress. We're not going to see big explosive gains in China coming up. Um, and so in this process of treading water, doing precisely what you said, um, they've got to deal with this this whole debt crisis. And the problem with the debt crisis is this. There are two kinds of debt in China. One is the domestic debt that's owed in renminbi 
or or the domestic yuan. And so for those Chinese citizens who are very supportive of Xi, Xi Jinping, I mean, not just sitting silent, but are, are vocal, the party can wipe out their debt. So that's not a problem. Those that are not supportive of Xi Jinping, um, the party uses that debt as a means of political control. You will pay. Kind of social credit. Social credit, right. Now, the other side of the debt ledger is the foreign debt. Now, the foreign debt has to be repaid. And the way that the foreign debt is repaid is they can't use the script currency, the domestic yuan, to do this. They have to go and release foreign currency held by that state organization called SAFE, the State Administration for Foreign Exchange. And they got to have foreign exchange to do that. Well, where does the foreign exchange come from? It only comes, China can only earn foreign exchange in two ways. The first we've talked about earlier is through foreign direct investment, Wall Street and other investors pouring their foreign currency into China by way of buying up stocks or making investments in corporate headquarters and so forth. But that means of investment has really, really dried up. I, th I saw numbers the other day that the foreign investment has slid down to something like 60, 60 some odd billion from numbers in the annual numbers in the three, 400, 500 billion range. So that is essentially, in my view, a collapse of foreign direct investment into China. So that's one way that China earns money. Well, that's a problem if you're going to pay, pay back on your, your foreign debt. The other one, how else can China earn money? Exporting. They have their whatever goods are made and they export them abroad. Well, China's economy is, is divided between a domestic side of production and a foreign side of production. Meaning on the same street, you could have companies that make, uh, let's say, toasters. And those toasters have different labor pool, different standards, uh, different marketing, different packaging than on the other side of the street, which are sent for export. And the difference is that the toasters maybe on the domestic side of the street don't have all the safety precautions, they don't have the testing, and they're a lot cheaper. And so in order to earn foreign currency, China has to export. That's why when you go to the um, visit of Xi Jinping to San Francisco in November and, and these various visits of uh, Commerce Secretary Raimondo and, and – um, Yellen and others, the big interest on the part of China is we got to get things back to normal. Let's let's stability. Let's go back to where we were. Why is that? They've got to get their exports up. Why? The foreign direct investment is down. So, so with this export problem, as people are moving away from buying Chinese goods, as supply chains are being reoriented. Um, the repayment of foreign debt is going to be a problem. And so how does the party solve that problem? Well, I guess they got to go to the, the uh, World Bank or the International Monetary Fund and restructure the debts. And, you know, they'll be on a payment plan and that'll tighten things up even further internally in China. It's not a pretty picture. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, David, if you've heard... I feel like in the last few years, there's been attempts on the Chinese side to convince foreign companies to buy debt in yuan denominations. Like instead of um, being like instead of taking like uh, investing in China and being expected to pay back in U.S. dollars, for example, that like they make an agreement that they will they will buy the yuan debt. Like they will agree to be paid back in the yuan. Um, is this a move that could help um, the Chinese 
like side like stabilize that economic debt problem? Uh, absolutely. If the um, creditor countries are, and let me pick this word diplomatically, if they're uh, not so smart and follow that suggestion, because what happens is when they receive that renminbi, that basically lashes them back to China in terms of, of dealings. And so um, you have seen an attempt for uh, China to, to do a what's called a, a yuan debt swap with Argentina. And the former president of Argentina said, OK, yeah, we're going to do this. But when Javier Malay got elected, he said, nothing doing. We're not, we're not doing this debt swap with China. And, and so I think that, that we're going to have a situation where China is going to attempt to do that. Um, and the only countries um, that are likely to buy into this are ones that um, maybe China has uh, a lot of economic control over. And those will be mainly under, underdeveloped countries. Yeah, it reminds me of kind of this whole thing where every once in a while you'll see headlines about how like China has a goal of making the UN a reserve, like a, a world reserve currency uh, and kind of like these headlines about how the dollar is, is doomed because the UN is like going to be the new reserve currency, something like that. But from what how you're explaining the Chinese economy, that seems almost impossible that because to be the reserve currency, you would have to let the UN be traded on the open market. And in order to do that, they would lose control over the value of the UN. Well, and that's right. And so what, what, what's happened is that China has created an offshore uh, yuan, and that uh, currency I mean, is used in a few, few modest places. Um, uh, but essentially, the party is never going to, they're, they're not going to let the, in, the internal domestic yuan, they're not going to let that float. Because as soon as they let it float, Shelley, what you said just kicks in. Um, they lose control. And so really what Beijing is trying to do is knock the dollar off of its peg. And, and that's what those articles uh don't really say, but that's what that's what the strategy of the party is: is to take the dollar down, in in some way. Um, and of course, this was one of the efforts that they were making with the whole BRICS group of countries to try to get a new currency. Um, and it that's going to be a very difficult, hard push. And I think the odds of that happening are just not that good, unless we in our country continue to do the um, enormous deficit spending and continue to to uh, weaken our own our own dollar um, we, we put it we put our dominance as the the world's trading currency in jeopardy so it sounds like there are not many good ways for China to solve its economic problems even if there isn't some kind of catastrophic collapse in the economy. It doesn't seem like it's going to reverse course. Like if it tried to increase exports by making everything cheaper, then it's essentially dumping. Foreign countries would put sanctions and more tariffs on Chinese goods. Um, but if there is this social upheaval in China, what would that mean for the economies of the rest of the world, many countries of which are very much tied to the Chinese economy? Well... Let me flip the question back on you, Chris. What do you think? It's uh, going to be it's going to be really hard on on. I think countries, really hard, right? I mean, in the U.S., there's there's not a lot of um, there's still not a lot of stuff produced domestically in the U.S. compared to what it was, you know, a couple of decades ago. But I have seen supply chain shifting. And I was at, at Target the other day, and I was just taking a look at uh, like the clothing on the rack. And, you know, five years ago, it was all made in China. And now you've got, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, Mexico, 
it's a lot more diversified and it's a lot less in China. And even many appliances that were once 100% China are now shifting to other countries. I remember we had come up with the idea of a Cracker Barrel index where you take a look at how much of the, the junk made in Cracker Barrel stores are made in what country. You can kind of get a sense for global yeah, economic in, trends. In 2017, we were th there and it was like all China, everything China. And now it's... I mean, it's, there's still some China, but it's a it's lot diversified. more diversified. Not really America, but very diverse. Yeah, not America. So, Well, I mean, I mean Matt, to your point, um, last year, Mexico surpassed China as a trading, significant trading partner of the United States. So, so where do we sit? You know, our number one trading partner is not China. Our number one trading partner is Canada. And in third or second position, it's now Mexico. And, you know, I don't think China is going to regain its prominence. And so a, a lot of those manufactured goods in, you know, some pretty sophisticated industries like uh, aviation and auto manufacturing and to some extent computers, surprisingly are coming out of Mexico now. And so our relationship with uh, uh, Mexico becomes increasingly important uh, over time. I'm wondering about, I mean, China, obviously the Chinese Communist Party sees this, right? That like countries are trying to, companies are trying to move to other places or um, French shoring or whatever. Is there something they could do to try to prevent that? I, mean, I guess I'm thinking of Terry Go. The Taiwanese businessman owns Foxconn, and Foxconn has been diversifying into like Vietnam and India uh, to make some of the Apple products and things like that. And then he was suddenly put under investigation, like financial investigation, his companies in China. Like, um, are they going to try to keep these companies in China? Like, can they control that? With the foreign espionage law. Yeah, exactly, Chris. And that's, you know, we've seen that with the. Um the detainment of uh, something like 200 American executives in China, uh, the disappearance of certain uh, ethnic Chinese business people. Um, look what happened, you know, look what happened to Jack Ma as an example. And so, yes, the party is going to try to do everything they can to retain that. That's why to legally for a company to wind up its operations in China and move out, it's a very expensive, they, they, and they've made it very complicated process that takes many months before they can comply with all the regulations and actually close up. So I, I, I think that we're going to see China, um, they'll be pushing to lower those uh, trade tariffs as hard as they possibly can so they can get their exports up. And they'll be making all kinds of pitches. You see it in um, uh, China Daily and the Global Times that their economy is doing well. Things are looking up. And uh, anytime there's a foreign investor that comes to China, they're going to treat them like Gavin Newsom. And I, I, I think that, that that's kind of the, what we're going to see coming down the road. Well, so then I guess China would be very concerned about uh, if, Trump is reelected and makes good on what he says about he's been talking about doing just a flat 60 percent or more tariff on all Chinese goods. Oh, yeah. You know, Chris, that's that's a, a really interesting point, because when Trump took office in 2017 and then moving into 2018, when the initial Chinese tariffs on Chinese goods were announced, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm assuming there were there were a handful of advisors that really understood the ramifications of that for the Chinese economy. But effectively, that caught the party off guard because those tariffs hit China below the waterline and it affected their ability to export. And, you know, the fact that the Biden administration has carried those tariffs on, you can see the the party just squealing like crazy, putting pressure on the Biden administration to lower or eliminate those tariffs. And uh, if 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 uh, Trump were to follow through on that 60 percent, um, 
we would see a social implosion. That's what we would see. Hmm. And then, you know, when you buy stuff on Timu, you won't be able to shop like a billionaire. You'll only be able to shop like a, you know, five-figure earner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think that shows what it, – it does show what Timu is kind of doing, right? Like trying to like almost get Americans addicted to these like cheap Chinese products. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think Timu must at, – at, I mean, obviously – we know that even though it's an American company, it's a Chinese uh, controlled company, but, but uh, th they are, I guess, kind of representative of this whole push to maintain that high level of exports, right? Like at all costs. And if they, and if people stop on Timu instead of Amazon and Walmart, then uh, there is that like direct addiction on Chinese goods, like you say. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's a, you know, kind of a, a an effort to hold on to their export earnings for foreign exchange purposes. And I think, you know, one of the things that's, you know, not related to your point, Matt, but I wanted to, to bring it out before before we wind up here. And, and, and that is this, is that when people do an analysis of the Chinese economy, they tend to do it on the Western style. That is, you assume that the methodology, the standards, and the data are consistent from state to state. And so when you aggregate the whole thing together, it, it makes sense. But in China, um, it's important for, for your viewers to remember that you have a very highly fragmented economy. So you have different economies regionally, different economies locally different economies in various municipalities. And then by industry, you have different economies in different industries. And so one of the things that has made, made it so difficult to aggregate, you know, the, get the big picture is that our Western ways of, 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 of looking at economy don't work because the data is not there. And the party secretaries they have an incentive to show progress. And so their numbers are always inflated and they pass it up to the National Bureau of Standards and they aggregate all these mistakes. And Xi Jinping knows he, he can't even tell what's happening with his own economy because he was a party secretary before and he participated in this overinflation and, and misrepresentation to protect uh, the, the, the lower level job holders. And so we get a situation here where how, how, how could you actually evaluate where China's economy is? And um, there's only, I think, one, one really interesting effort uh, by a former uh, premier of China based on, on uh, three factors. And the first one was what's the actual railroad use by productive companies? The second factor is what is the actual amount of electricity used by productive companies? And, you know, the, the third way was um, what are the loans being made to productive facilities? And this was done by a uh, former premier, uh, Li Ka-shung, who mysteriously died in, in, in Shanghai. And, there was another attempt to try to figure out where China was, a picture of its economy, by uh, the famous Bo Xi Lai, who's now in prison. And Bo Xi Lai never got as far as uh, Li Kashung, but he made an attempt. And so I think that, that it's very difficult going forward, and I would just encourage people to be very wary of folks that are you know, projecting that the whole country is going to fold up like a, like a tent tomorrow and we're going to have another Zimbabwe on our hands, that, that's not going to happen. What we're going to happen is this level leveling out, China's hit the product, productivity wall, they're going to try to do more hard, hard development. There's going to be, as Shelley, as you pointed out, efforts to continue to, to, to capture innovation by stealing or 
forcing companies. They'll try to hold on to what they've got. And all of this adds to tremendous national security pressures that I hope our, our, uh, our White House and our national security advisors are watching because this, this kind of stress uh, in historically has caused uh, leadership in countries to make irrational mistakes like an invasion of Taiwan or like an invasion of India or something in the South China Sea. That's the real danger. I mean, it sounds like, based on what you're saying, nobody really knows how the Chinese economy works. Uh, I think that is that is a really, really great statement, Chris. And they make all kinds of predictions, and then they run math based on faulty data to get the results that they want. But we can see with, if you start connecting the dots like you have been doing on this program, you can start to see that clearly China has hit an economic wall. And how they go through that wall or how they go over it uh, remains to be seen. But we're not going to see these years of, of explosive growth that we've seen in the past. They are basically, basically in a situation where they can't go to stage two and there's going to be a leveling out and and I, I think we're going to see an economy kind of like Japan that, that moves along at a, at a very, very modest pace in terms of growth. Well, so if that spurs the Communist Party to take military action with Taiwan, South China Sea, or India, that doesn't make things better. Like for a while, the Chinese economy will have more things to make, weapons, planes, but that, that doesn't seem to solve anything in the long run. You're absolutely right. And um, that's why I've used the word irrational. Because in any type of military operation, you look at the, the necessity of China in terms of its need for energy imports, its need for food imports, uh, and the reaction that will happen in the Malacca Strait in terms of potential blockade and cutting China off. Essentially, what happens after the initial let, let, let me use the military term, the initial first strike or the first two weeks of any type of, of combat situation, China's economy will go down to something like a pilot light on a gas stove. And what does that do? That's where your social implosion, the risk comes in. So Chris, you're absolutely right. It's completely irrational. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think that this idea that some people in the party might have that, you know, they're jealous of Taiwan's success. And if only the PRC could take Taiwan, then they would have Taiwan's success and they would have a successful province. But, but you know, because as you said earlier, it, there's something about authoritarian controls that stifles innovation. Like if Taiwan were fully under the control of the Communist Party, innovation in Taiwan would essentially stop, meaning that the value of holding Taiwan is now extremely limited, well, economically at least. And and that's why you see um, uh, the chip production, uh, TSMC, building plants in Japan and uh, and in the U.S. In, in in an effort to diversify its holdings in case something like that were to happen. And and uh, the the other the other so what you just said, Matt, is you know you have probably seen this map, and it shows a map of Taiwan, and then it shows mainland China as uh, whatever it is called. What do they, what do they call it? I guess that would be West Taiwan. And it's, it's sort of the, the, the implication that, you know, if Taiwan were part of China, maybe Taiwan could make China like Taiwan, but that would involve getting rid of the communist party. And that's, that's a, that's a, that's another problem. Not going to happen. Well, it sounds like the like what could happen is if the Communist Party feels like it goes down this irrational warpath, you could find China becoming like an actualized version of North Korea, a country that has nuclear weapons to hold the rest of the world hostage. Right. Exactly. In one sentence, that's 
precisely correct. That's that is the risk of where we sit right now. Actualized North Korea. I just I just came up with that. We're going to have to use that more. I I'm now terrified. Yeah. I mean, we've always compared uh we've always said China is North Korea with better PR. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it could really be forced into that situation where yeah, they're like the Kim regime, just like actually, only they actually have the weapons to make good on their threats. Plus, that, like a lot of the world depends on their products. Where we started out this conversation and where the the viewers probably uh, were coming from at the beginning of this show um, was the notion that, hey, you know, um, we can see the whole bankruptcy of Evergrande. We can see the um, stock market is imploding. And basically, um, we don't need to worry about China anymore. And that is the American cultural complacency problem. It sets in and then everybody kind of goes, dusts their hands, and goes off and does something else and just forget about China. Don't worry about it. It's, you know, they're going to eat themselves alive. And and where we have come to the end of this conversation is uh, the fact that, um, Chris, you've developed the phrase, an actualized North Korea, and Matt has verbalized that this is a really, really scary situation. So we're not, we're not talking about just a, a slide in the stock market or or maybe the GDP is a few points off of what the party is projecting, or um, that uh, you know China's overbuilt some stuff. That's not what we're talking about here at all. What we're talking about here is uh, the evolvement of an economy to become a serious global threat because it has hit a wall. I mean, so clearly what we should do as the U.S. government should, you know, do more business with China to like prop up their economy to prevent them from becoming actualized North Korea. Right. Oh, please. (laughs) Uh, Well, Hey, I'm, I, you know, we laugh and smile at that, but we may see, we may see efforts uh, to do just that, that, um, uh, you know, kind of where we sit, Kelly is when the Reagan administration really started to get into gear with its Star Wars program and pushed the Soviet Union up against the wall. And and the implosion was was messy and there was no nuclear war. I mean, I, I know that there were many national security types at the time that were really sweating it. Um, but an actualized North Korea uh, let's pray they don't hit that red button. But who knows what the future is really going to bring? And I just, I, I just do not see China being a. The party cannot flip this around unless it changes its authoritarian ways. And they're a hundred percent behind the Leninist principles, and they're not going to do that. And Xi Jinping is not going to do that. So that's where we sit. Do you see any way out of this situation other than like between the spectrum of like, let's just give China everything they want to actualize North Korea? What is the way out of this? Is it that the Chinese people do rise up and go Shishesku on Xi Jinping and the Communist Party? Well, I think that's that's certainly one thing that could happen. And and that is the the, the fear of the party leadership. So they'll do everything they can to to protect against that. Um, I think in terms of the, the trade situation, the way that um, we kind of help hold it together is take a hard look at the way that we define national security in our country. And so that means that in the past, national security has really been defined in traditional military terms hardware, equipment, software, chips, those kinds of things. And we need to look at broadening the definition of our own national security um, uh, so that we get things like um, 
uh, our water resources, our agricultural resources, so that we hold on to those. Um, but we can still do uh, trade with China. It's just that we have to be very careful on what we are exporting to that country that lo is looking to take the United States down or take aggressive action. So we could have, um, uh, I, I would think, agricultural exports would be would be safe as long as they're they're the farms and ag land are in American hands. Um, I think we have to watch out for China's extraordinary efforts occurring right now to get into Mexico, to get around um, the USMCA and get their products into the United States uh, tariff free. Um, but I think there are limited ways that we can, we can trade with China. That's not very optimistic, but I think, you know, it needs to be tightened down quite a bit and they'll continue to, to muddle along. And that's, that's about the best I can offer, Chris. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Most of these podcasts, I'm left with a feeling of terror at the end, but I would say this one, I am filled with the most terror <laughs> of any of the podcasts we've done. Well, beautifully put. You know the the uh, another issue for another time out outside of my wheelhouse is um, I've had some conversations recently about the PLA's bio warfare program. It's really terrifying. It makes uh, nuclear war look look like a garden party. The the efforts that the PLA is doing in bio warfare. Um, have caused me to, to uh, lay awake at night. But that's something for another show, and I'm not it's outside of my wheelhouse, the expertise on that. I just, for what little I've known, it's very frightening what they are doing in terms of trying to genetically alter uh, diseases and viruses to, to affect only certain ethnic groups and... Uh, playing with, with uh, situations unlike a nuclear one where you can basically control the area that you're going to hit, whereas with a virus, you can't. So, Yeah, great. Now, now I'm optimistic that there are still new levels of terror I can reach. Uh, <laughs> thank you for joining us. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> So on the one hand, I feel pretty proud that I coined that term, actualized North Korea. I hope I get cited in books in the future. I hope there's a future, though, where people can write books, and it's not just nuclear winter. Because of actualized North Korea? Because of actualized North Korea. Mm. Mm. Maybe someday in the future an archaeologist will find this YouTube video. That's right. It'll be the only thing that survives. <laughs> Who was this Chris Chapel? Some say he was a god. Others uh, say he was the supreme leader of these United States for life. Uh, you know, this is the kind of show that you wouldn't be able to really have under a Leninist system. Oh? This type of innovation that we are creating right here. That's right. That's the true. freedom to fail. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually can explain, Matt, like why there's no innovation or very little innovation in it. Well, I mean, you do have an economics degree, so go on. Well, no, this is not from an economics degree. This is from watching people who've lived under a Leninist system, like my Chinese relatives. Yes, like, okay. Uh, so essentially, nobody wants to stick their neck out, right? Like everybody lives in fear of being targeted for doing something wrong. And then there is like a – the system creates a vast bureaucracy where – the way to succeed is to get a stable position and like stay there or move up, but you don't move up by innovation. You move up by pleasing your bosses. So like, okay, but so within a company, you're saying that the average worker is better off not innovating, knowing that, you know, because some innovation, if, if you're a worker at a company and you want to help that company innovate, four out of five of your ideas might fail. Uh, in an American company, they kind of budget for that. 
whereas in a Chinese company they don't? Or are you talking mainly about entrepreneurs? No, I'm not talking about entrepreneurs. First of all, people weren't allowed to do business until what reform and opening up, right? Yeah, like the 80s. EVs. But like you were not allowed to have a private business no matter how small in China. But yeah, I'm talking about like in a system, like whether you're, you know, when my parents were, were young, everybody worked for the state. Right. So, you know, you were not um, incentivized to put effort into doing your job well because there was no benefit to you. In oh. fact, there could only be possibly like a negative effect if you stepped out of line too far. That Do you makes, know what I mean? That makes sense because like in America, if you want to come up with some invention, you can try it. And if you succeed, you may become wildly successful. And if you fail, well, you fail, but you're not going to prison. Or it can be, uh, but, you know, Edison just steal from Tesla. Yes, but the, I mean, in, in terms of what you're saying, I think that really does make sense. Like, there's you're in a communist system, you don't earn more by innovating. Uh, you can only and if your lose idea your job. fails, you know, the L best case your, scenario is you lose your job, probably. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I had an uncle who worked. He was an artist actually, but he worked for like a state magazine. It was like an arts magazine, and the only art you could feature was like the state sponsored art you know what i mean i mean that's not inventing the light bulb or whatever but there's a prescribed thing that you can do and you cannot step outside of it which means there is not the conditions for innovation or free thinking you know so, so no innovation in chinese art either well i mean this is what i don't you know there are people who are socialists or like communists who think that oh you know if we just uh, uh, abolish the capitalist system and then you know, we can all just like make art together or something like that. And then you can be like Ai Weiwei and you, you do art and you push the boundaries and then pretty soon the Communist Party comes after you. Yeah, there's a that. reason why Leninist systems also don't create great art. Like, uh, you know, unless you're really into like, like beefcake portrayals of Russian and Chinese men. Like linking I, I mean, arms. I, I am, and, but, you know. but go on. Yeah, so it's just, there's... It's all propaganda art. Like, there's no innovation there either. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, look at Chernobyl, the TV show. Like, it just, the, the whole system is set up so that you can only uh, be blamed so no one wants to make any effort. Right. And that is ultimately the, the downfall of those economies and why China can't really move into stage two. Yeah, I mean, I think even now... Um, not everybody works for the state anymore, right? Although state-owned companies are coming back more and more. But there's still a lot of bureaucracy. There's still a lot of uh, – I, I know – I've known people who work for companies in China and they're like, I did nothing. Like there was nothing for me to do. And But they you know, kept their head down and they didn't get fired. Yeah. And, and that's what counts. So you're saying all the effort I put into making this show with you guys, I could have just worked for a state-owned company and made art? Uh, worked and art are both subjective terms in that sentence. Amen. And I'm so glad you chose not to do that. Yes, yes. I hope you are glad I didn't do that too. Never choose communism. What could you do if you just said no to communism? Dare to keep a kid off communism. I'm coming up with all kinds of great things on this podcast. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Chow. I'm Shelley John. And I'm Matt Ganesha. We'll talk to you next time.